Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Dan Malthrop, Chief Executive here and a proud member. I'm pleased to introduce our forum today. It's our first in a series examining workforce development challenges and opportunities facing the region with local leaders implementing innovative job, transition, apprenticeship, and workforce development programs. As the United States experiences a rapid and profound transition from an industrial economy to a digital, global, and knowledge-based and service-based economy, these changes are being felt right here at home, and they're being felt deeply. The Fund for Our Economic Future recently produced a report titled Two Tomorrows. The authors write that there is a there is substantial misalignment between skill attainment of Northeast Ohio workforce, Northeast Ohio's workforce, and estimated demand as measured by job openings in the highest growing industries. Additionally, our economy appears to be overweighted in industries that are not growing nationally. As our economy evolves and employment opportunities change, depending more and more on computers, technology, and automation, with hospitality and healthcare also contributing to the mix in meaningful ways, the problem isn't so much that there won't be enough jobs. Rather, the problem is we don't right now have enough workers with the right skills. And it appears as though we are only now beginning to lay the groundwork to address this problem. To be sure, this is an enormous region-wide challenge involving quite literally the entire economy. This is a bit like that question that people ask, how do you eat an elephant? The answer, of course, is one bite at a time. So in City Club fashion, we begin one question and one conversation at a time. How do we bridge the gap? How do we ensure we have the workforce ready for the next economic wave? Here to answer those questions and others are a group of local leaders who ask themselves these very questions every day. Moderating our conversation today is IdeaStream reporter and producer Darielle Snipes. Ms. Snipes is an award-winning journalist who has worked in Oklahoma City, Baltimore, Detroit, and Indianapolis before coming to Cleveland. Currently, she works in daily television as a reporter for Ideas on WVIZ PBS. Ms. Snipes, I turn the program over to you to introduce our guests. All right. Thank you, Dan. Hello, everyone. I'll introduce our panel. I begin with Bethany Friedlander. She's the president and CEO of Newbridge Center for the Arts and Technology. Um, it's a community-based career training center that addresses the needs of residents and youth who live in some of Cleveland's most challenged neighborhoods. Next to her is Dr. Denise Reading, a chief executive officer of Get Worker Fit, an organization that's created to support employers in filling jobs job vacancies and job seekers and fulfilling career goals. And next to her is Dr. Terrence Robinson of Magnet Manufacturing Advocacy and Growth Network, Vice President of Workforce Development and Economic Inclusion. Please welcome our panel. So with this conversation, um, it's based on the report to tomorrow's and it's broken up into three parts, which is job creation, job preparedness, and job access. So let's start with job preparedness and preparation. So it is well it's well documented that there is a skills gap here in Northeast Ohio. And Terrence, I begin with you. And at Magnet, you are helping high school students learn about the manufacturing industry early on so that they know that it's not their grandfather's manufacturing company. Just tell me a little bit about how you're educating them about how they can have a, a thriving career in manufacturing. Uh, thank you, Dario. Um, the program that we've developed at Magnet, and actually through the generous support of uh, Cle Cleveland Foundation and also KeyBank, uh, as well as other funders who have come on in the last couple of years, is called the Early College Early Career Program. And our program is a state-recognized pre-apprenticeship program where we actually start working with high schoolers to create manufacturing awareness in ninth and 10th grade. Uh, it's, it's really a four-year program of us being integrated at the high schools that we're participating in and partnering with. Uh, but we create uh, manufacturing awareness about careers, we engage parents, we also work with community partners so that the whole community partner of a high school understands that manufacturing has transformed. Advanced manufacturing is much different uh, than their grandfather's manufacturing. And then beginning in the 11th grade year, uh, we uh, work with a select set of students to uh, participate in a two-year uh, pre-apprenticeship at a company, and it's more of a one-on-one -on -one relationship. Some of our major partners are Lincoln Electric, um, Swage Lock, Parker Hannafin, and Nordson. And these companies have made uh, the have taken the risk and actually made 
uh, the uh, sacrifice and adjustments so that they can bring students on, which is a paid internship while they're in high school. And these students average uh, about eight hours a week their junior year. Uh, they go into a full-time internship over this senior, this summer between their junior and senior year. And then uh, their senior year, they can work anywhere from 10 to 12 hours a week uh, with the opportunity to uh, gain full-time employment with that company at the end of their two-year apprenticeship. And it's really great because working with the companies in while they're in high school, they can really learn uh, what they need to have on hands-on experience. Oh, definitely. They're actually learning more than just hands-on technical experience. One of the biggest challenges that uh, companies say they have with young people coming into the workforce are those professional skills. So students are actually learning the socialization of what it is uh, to work in a professional manufacturing environment, the expectations, the accountability that goes along with that, in addition to learning the uh, very necessary technical skills. One of our uh, higher education partners, uh, Tri-C, Cuyahoga Community College, does a lot of the training so that they, at the same time they're, they're gaining the technical skill, they're learning the professional skills that are necessary for long-term college or career success. Great. And Bethany, um, at Newbridge, you offer courses so potential employees can get certified to work in culinary industry or the healthcare industry, but you also work closely, especially with the healthcare, with the, with the companies. So if there is a new way of doing things or a new tool that you can teach that to the students right away so that they will be ready once they get on the job. Right. So our partners, uh, Cleveland Clinic, you University hospitals and Metro are in real time discussing our curriculum with us. And we're talking to both the managers on the floor as well as the HR professionals so that if there's something that's missing in our curriculum, we can change that not in a year, but immediately to the next session. So we know that the training that they're getting is directly addressing the specific needs of the hospitals. And, and and Denise at Get Worker Fit, you are also working with the employers to figure out exactly, because sometimes the skills gap necess necessarily isn't that there's a skills gap, there's a communication gap, because sometimes the job descriptions don't fit exactly what the employer or employee needs to do. So you're working with them to say, well, is this, are these the skills they really need for this position? Can you explain a little bit more? Right, after spending about 10 years working with the Fortune 500 and then mid and small size companies, what we found is that we would take a job description and what we would look at is what did the last person do, not what is really needed. What are the competencies, what is the skill, what's the capacity that people need to have to do this job? So when they post the job, they're not getting the person on the other end who has that skill set. And the person who's seeking the job doesn't even know what are the skills and competencies that that employer wants and will need and how do I prepare for that? So that gap in between is really a communication gap about what is it people really need? Is it really a degree or is it a set of skills? Is it a really a certification that says a third party says I can do something? Or is it um, a set of experiences that I can document and I can prove that I have? And so building that communication to understand what's really needed and help employers articulate that better, but also help the job seeker understand how do I know if I have those and if I don't have them, how do I get them? That's what we're doing. And so also you have a career coaching aspect at mm -hmm. Get Worker Fit. Can you just talk about how you're helping the potential job seeker figure out exactly what it is they want to do so that they can be successful? Absolutely. So one of the things that we learned when we began to look at this problem and said, how can we kind of close this communication gap, is we said, what's happening for the person who's seeking a job? Now, I don't know in the room, I think my friend here will know, but do you all know what a histotechnologist is? So I was in front of a whole group of people helping to coach someone, and the job opportunities for this particular young woman came up, and it said histotechnologist. Well, I don't know what a histotechnologist is, and I'm in this business, but we have a high demand for them in Cleveland, and they pay great, and, and the hospitals are hiring them. So what happens is that people don't even know what jobs are out there. So with our career coaching, we begin to look to say, well, what's happening for career counseling in our high schools, in our colleges? The average high school student's getting 38 minutes of career coaching. And that career coaching isn't about what would you be good at and what is needed. It's about what do you like? Well, I can lock like ballet dancing, but I'm probably not gonna be doing that, right? Mm -hmm. So I've gotta find out what's good in me. What do I have? What am I naturally good at? And how does that fit with the employer? And so this career coaching was one of the biggest gaps because we don't have the ratio of counselors to, to kids. 
And so we've been working with our partners at College Now and the First T and Cuyahoga County Library and many other nonprofits to say, let's relook at career coaching and talk about how we look at assessment and career coaching together to give a direction. And so I'll throw this out to anyone, but with, when it comes to job preparedness, um, you know, you're starting young, you're starting them at ninth grade, just getting them thinking about a career. But a lot of times, you know, with your, your organization, they've already gone through high school, they might have gone through college and not been successful. I mean, how is it that getting them on board so that they are successful, but then also, on the other hand, getting the companies on board to really, so that the, gap, the gap won't be there that much, so that, you know, that they're, that they're talking to each other? So our participants on average are, it's a 30 year old woman who's coming in with one to three children and they're coming in with a fully articulated interest in healthcare, primarily because there's been a crisis in their family and they've either needed care themselves or family members needed care. So they understand the importance of that role. We're gonna get over 750 applications this year for 175 training slots. So we know that they've pre-identified. Um, the, the issue for us is sometimes the fact that the hospital hiring system is long. Um, it's, a, it's a long process. It's typically 80 to 90 days from first application to hiring. And so we think our job is to shorten that process so that we become a shorthand note that tells them that we have exactly the skills that they want. So we've been able to take that 89 days down to around 56. And that's two paychecks. That's a huge difference. And so um, that's our way of helping that dialogue and encouraging them to come in and interview on site. We're a testing site for the STNA, right? So we want everything to happen in one location. So you enroll, you have your classrooms in one classroom. There's no bells. You're not walking down a hallway. There's not multiple teachers. It's one teacher, one room. That's the same room you're gonna get your state tested testing in and that's where you're gonna interview for your job. Do you guys have anything else? Yeah, I can add, um, you said, how do you get the young people interested and also the employers? Where I think, and, and I see a lot of our partner organizations that uh, work with manufacturers, the manufacturers are interested uh, because they actually have a talent pipeline issue and a talent pipeline challenge. And so they're very interested in what manufacturers may have felt before some of the other industry sectors that are now feeling uh, the, the, the constraint of having a uh, low selection of talent. They recognized early uh, or have recognized over the last 10 years their talent pool was shrinking. So when we, when uh, Mag Magnet created and went to our employer members or our employer partners that sat on our board and said we can build out a model that could be reflective of the European apprenticeship model, uh, manufacturers were like, okay, if you can build it, we, we will commit to the two year uh, pre-apprenticeship. And that's, the, that's where I can say from the employer perspective, they were ready for the talent because they know they're in a battle for talent and if they just let uh, high school students go through high school and go to college that their opportunity or their opportunity to gain that talent shrinks uh, the, the further along they go so they uh, the main factors we work with and we've are, have had conversations with are very ready to be engaged at the high school level to see how we they can make their careers uh, or their industry much more attractive to high school students and as a community, what do you think that we need to do to make sure that um, our young people are prepared for these jobs so that they will get them? So is it, is it in the schools? Are they learning what they need to learn with you know, STEM or whatever, um, math? What is it that they need to, what is it that we're not doing that we should be doing to make sure that they are prepared? I know that's a loaded question, but I'm just <laughs> asking. <laughs> yeah, I, and, and, and I will say it from this perspective is that we are now starting, if you look at some of the policies that are being changed at the Ohio Department of Education, as well as Ohio Department of Higher Education, we are making career readiness just as much of a focus as college readiness. The challenge is that most of our uh, local school systems have always been uh, college readiness for the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, hence that you don't have that many vocational schools that are still in operation or existence. So with the new focus on career readiness and starting to create graduation pathways along a career readiness outlook, it's changing the focal point at the local schools. So local schools are now looking to engage businesses in order 
to try to help their students become more career ready. The challenge that you're facing is that for the last 30 to 40 years, that has not been a focus. So you need a mindset change, not only amongst students and parents, but also amongst principals and educators and some of our education partners. Uh, I believe Wycliffe City Schools is here. They, those school districts who can have that innovative thought process are going to be those school districts that can really start meeting the needs of their local uh, business uh, industries. No, I think that I think that when we talk about this piece about what's happening in the schools, um, one of the things that's happened is so much is mandated, and we have so many testing requirements. But the one thing that we're not doing is engaging young people in this unbelievable plethora of job opportunities. And so to have the young person early on in their career, around tenth grade, have the opportunity to figure out where they might have capacity, where they might have talent, um, has been one of the most empowering things that we've seen happen. Somebody taking an assessment and saying, here's what's great in me. A young man the other night gave me a, 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 an email, right? And it's uh, Dean Reading uh, from my old days, right? Dean Reading, uh, I was getting in trouble. My friends were ragging on me because I'm the guy. I, I clean tennis shoes. I can't afford the expensive ones, so then I try to get guys to pay me whatever. I took this assessment, and I found out that I am creative, enterprising, and social. These are the foundations for being entrepreneurial and using my skill sets. So now I know that I have the opportunity to take what other people tease me about my community and turn it into a degree that would be about being an entrepreneur. Or a young guy who says to me, you know, I got in big trouble. I had a few run-ins with the law because I like to spray paint things in Cleveland. <laughs> now I've taken this whole assessment and here's what I've learned about myself. And now I know that I'm going to be a barber because that spray paint design and my enterprising and my skill sets and what I like about my own personality and being with people, that's a great job. I can make $90,000 a year as a great barber. I didn't know you could do things like that. So we've got to also be sure that we're talking to young people about what their opportunity is. Yeah. And, and I think that as, those of us as adults, we're limited. We didn't have thousands of opportunities. And the other thing I think that we have to do is to say, this is going to change every other day. Every other day, something dies and something comes. And so we're going to change the whole mindset of young people. We love to say in my long years in higher education, you've got to be a lifelong learner. Anybody in the room can say, you know, be a lifelong learner. Be a lifelong learner for purpose. In order to grow and continue, I have to be able to anticipate the future and know that I've got to move. And that's what we have to help our young people get while they're in high school, so that as they're moving through their life, if their life circumstances change, if as an adult their company ends, stops, whatever, they know I'm not done because I still have something in me I can still learn. But I want to make a plug too, and I want to say that the, the technical skills are great and we're very proud of the things that we teach, but we also know that uh, people lose jobs because they're, they don't have the social emotional skill to be able to stay in that position. And so I think that the, the thing that we can teach to high schoolers are the same things because the things that make you persevere after a really bad math class um, or when you don't get picked for the baseball team are the same skills that will keep you persevering and successful at work. And so I think we need to start those also early and mm -hmm. reinforce them in every single class. And I can tell you that we wouldn't be able to do the work we do if we didn't have case management partners towards employment, Youth Opportunities Unlimited, Ohio Guidestone, who step in and take that more comprehensive 360 look at the individual to make sure that they are really prepared. And they're prepared for things like giving and receiving feedback, something I do not do well, something I could use a class on. Um, and so they need, and they need to actually practice those things as well. So yes, it, we make sure that every single person walks away with 100 blood draws. But you also need to be able to walk away with at least one bad test score, at least one bad critique. And it's, it's your ability to handle both that I think make you successful in both high school and then beyond. And this, this issue about the professional skills or the soft skills, if you look at all the research since about 2014, multiple stories by Accenture, Gallup, others, the employers are saying the number one set of skills they want are the professional skills. Can you can communicate? Can you work in teams? Can you problem solve? They say that's more important than the technical skills because the technical skills are changing so often we can continue to upskill our employee base, mm -hmm. but if they don't come in with those core skills. So in Get Worker Fit, one of the things we offer is a certification to employers that says if these young people or these adults, whoever's in our database, 
they're there and they have this certification, we're guaranteeing you that they have those professional skills. Mm -hmm. And it's those professional skills that don't only help them cope with that employer, but cope in life. And so I think that, that focus on those sets of skills, um, the employers have been telling us now since early 2014, this is our top priority and we want evidence of it. And another aspect was job creation. Um, and, and it also in, in the industries that maybe aren't as popular or, at, or in as demand. And Denise, you were talking about there's this new thing called virtual jobs. Mm -hmm. Can you explain a little bit about that? So one of the things that has been part of the dialogue that we've been having here in Cleveland over the last year is, is where are the jobs? You know, if I live in this neighborhood, who can I go to work for? Or if I'm in rural America, where are the jobs? And so what most people don't know is that almost 47% of all jobs can be virtual and or have some part of work from home or work from another space. And that number is growing every year. And so for a long time, we thought that these were low pay uh, call center jobs, right? And if you lived in rural America and didn't have broadband internet, you couldn't even do that job. So what we're looking at now is to say, how do we work with these jobs that can range anywhere from $13 an hour to $250 an hour across about seven or eight industry sectors and bring those jobs into communities, into shared workspaces where people can get access to broadband. So while I may be working at home, I'm really working maybe in the tech hive or I may be working at, over at Karamu or in a church basement with 20 other people. We're working for 13 different companies, so we have a sense of community, but we're bringing jobs in. When we look at the Opportunity Corridor, we're saying, you know, there are 15,000 residents, 7,500 may be unemployed or underemployed, and not all of them are going to go into construction jobs. And so once that's done in a few years, it's not like industry is just going to pile in here when we have no skilled labor. So could we get virtual jobs today for those folks so that they get experience, which will attract employers in the future who may have brick and mortar operations? And Terrence, I know in the manufacturing company um, industry, you know, it's slightly going down with them, um, but is there any way do you think in the near future with especially with the small and mid companies that you do consult at Magnet that they will have opportunities to, to create more jobs? Yeah, I actually think that the uh, the need for skilled labor and manufacturers are there and 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 that the need for uh, the technical skills has not gone down. Um, it may have changed as far as the skills that the young people may need to go into those career fields. But Magnet just recently did a report um, and we talked about the automation and a lot of individuals or people think that because manufacturing has some components that can be automated that it's going to cause for a reduction in uh, the need for employees or uh, the need for the skilled trades. But that's not totally true. It's going to change the skills that individuals need to have. And that's a part of our, uh, when you talk about our education partners and our training partners, being able to help individuals have that lifelong learning for a purpose, as Denise stated. Uh, having young people have the agility uh, to not only say, I'm being trained in this skill today, but what is the skill that I'm going to need for tomorrow? Because this job that I'm doing today may actually transform uh, beginning tomorrow. And Bethany, obviously, healthcare, that's not going away. <laughs> we need that more than ever now. So. Right, and I think that part of what we are trying to do is trying to provide sometimes the first really positive academic experience that the students had so that they are best teed up to know that they are going to need, particularly in healthcare, you're going to need a post-secondary experience to have a true career pathway to true economic self-sufficiency. So 32% of our students have had a post-secondary experience. That means they're coming in, they've got debt and often in default. We work with college now to restructure that. And we talk to them really from day one to talk about the fact that this is step one. We want step one to go really well and be successful. But then once you're stabilized at work, you need to take advantage of tuition reimbursement. You need to continue the skill development. And we want to make sure that you do that in a way that's really fiscally responsible. So yeah, I think that they're, the, the jobs are there. Mm -hmm. They are constantly changing. And they are going to need training. And all those things are true. And it's going to be people who have perseverance and grit and resiliency uh, and the ability to manage um, themselves and their lives that are going to be people who succeed. 
And also in the report, it talks about systemic racial exclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, a lot. You just said a lot of the your your students are under 30 black females who have one to three children, um, and also the unemployment rate in Northeast Ohio and Ohio shows that there's a higher unemployment rate for blacks than it is for whites. You also deal with people who are coming out of jail or prison um, and have a criminal record and might have a hard time getting a job. Um, I, I, I'm starting with Bethany, Bethany, but it's for everyone. I mean, how do we how do we get rid of the systemic racial exclusion that's happening and get more people working. Right, so we were really ex excited to open our doors and to primarily be working in healthcare, but we recognized that we had a limitation. Um, we used the same criteria that they use for hiring, which meant that all of our participants had to have a high school diploma or a GED. They needed to have a clean criminal background check and they needed to have a clean drug screen. We knew that wasn't hitting everybody that we wanted to touch in our, in our neighborhood. So we started the culinary program because it allowed us to bring in people who had felony um, backgrounds and also people who didn't have high school diplomas. We also started a joint GED program with our STNA training program because why not do them simultaneously? We know for a fact that people will do better on their GED testing. They're more likely to pass and it takes shorter time to, uh, to prepare if they're in um, vocational training that they really care about and that they're passionate about. So we're really attempting to open our doors and be as and, and be as accepting and diverse as possible. Um, so it's been a, it's been a good change, I think, and it's been really nice to see the students who come from very different backgrounds supporting each other in that. Mm -hmm. And Denise, how do you think it could get rid of this? So one of the things we've done with Get Worker Fit is we've built a database that searches for job seekers. Employers can search by, for job seekers by looking at competencies and skills. And so the first thing it does is say, you know, here's the competencies and skills that are top priority for this job. It searches this database. And what I like to say is that, you know, it allows Letitia and Linda to both show up as people who have skills before somebody knows my name and makes an assumption about what my race is or what my background is. We've also said if we create this database of competencies and skills and we can guarantee it for employers, that is a major disruptor. Indeed, Monster, et cetera. It's a word search algorithm. If you can pay somebody enough money, you can get your resume to the top. But what the employers will tell you is I've looked at 200 resumes, I've hired people, and 90 days later they can't do the job. So by looking at competency and skill, we're able to say these folks in our database, they may have a criminal record. They may be a second chancer. They may have had a drug addiction or abuse. But we can talk with employers about saying I'm willing to opt in. And, and I understand that these people are getting these services. What I want are people who have the skills to do the job here today and tomorrow. And so by creating a new way to search for jobs for employers, we take out some of that bias that we know exists, that we don't want to admit, but we know it exists. So let's look for skills first and then say, oh, I'm surprised this person from manufacturing is a young African-American woman who's the parent of two children, not this young Caucasian guy from the West Side. And in the manufacturing world, what do you think? Yeah, so how do we uh, rectify 400 years of systemic racial exclusion? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for an easy <laughs> answer. Two minutes or less. Um, I would say from advanced manufacturing, and I was actually asked this question when I was presenting two weeks ago in D.C. Um, I think that where we are in advanced manufacturing right now is a place where the need for employees have outweighed some of the systemic racial exclusion practices that have been there in the past. And when I say that is that manufacturers have said for 15 years they need talent. And so now if they are saying they don't care what the talent looks like, and I'm not saying that they're just now saying it, but they need talent to the point where it doesn't matter if it's a male, female, person of color, they need someone that can come in and actually produce. And part of our program, because we are building a talent pipeline beginning in high school, 60% uh, of our students are African Americans and therefore when you're working with a younger generation you're going to almost by default build a more diverse population because the high schools now are becoming a more majority minority. I do want to say too though um, having a job coach and having an employer know that Denise comes with a job coach that's easily accessible um, for six months or a year post that first employment can make it easier to think of taking a risk on Denise because now I know that if I have a difficult conversation to have I've got somebody who's skilled who can help facilitate that conversation so I think that it's important to think about technical skills training and then job assistance but you've got to add that retention piece on the back end and it's not 90 days it's a year
where people really get to have those difficult conversations with another person in the room, checking for understanding, and then following up. All right, well, I wanna say thank you. We are hitting the midway of the discussion, and here's Dan with a little bit more. Today, we're enjoying a forum with local leaders spearheading innovative workforce development programs featuring Bethany Friedlander, President and CEO of Newbridge, Dr. Denise Reading, Chief Executive Officer of Get Worker Fit, and Dr. Terrence Robinson, Vice President of Workforce Development and Economic Inclusion at Magnet, that's the Manufacturing Advocacy and Growth Network. Our moderator is Darielle Snipes, for, uh, of our primary media partner, IdeaStream. We're about to begin the audience Q&A, and we welcome question, ev questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, and those of you joining us via our radio broadcast or our webcast. If you'd like to tweet your question, please tweet it at the City Club, and our staff will work it into the program. Holding our microphones today are our Youth Forum Council Chair, Tiolu Orsanya, and Content Coordinator, Bliss Davis. And we have our first question, please. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, this is a really important topic. I'm Merle Johnson. I sit on the State Board of Education, and uh, we have plenty of conversations um, constantly about the career readiness and college readiness. My question is to um, Mr. Robinson. We saw what can happen uh, with the Starbucks uh, situation, what can happen when employees are not imp uh, pro properly trained uh, in dealing with customers. and so. In your program, which I think is wonderful, where you work with the 9th, 10th, and 11th graders, um, how trained are the employers who are going to be um, working with these young people, especially when you talk about cultural competency, and they may be working with young people uh, of a different uh, ethnicity who they may have never worked with before. So I'm talking about not only anti-bias training, but possibly trauma-informed uh, strategies so that they understand that when you come from a world of, of trauma, it's, it sometimes affects the brain and causes you to react in a way that someone who doesn't know you may not understand. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, and that was actually one of the questions that was posed uh, to Magnet when we first created the program by the Cleveland Foundation. And formal training, uh, I will say that there is not an instituted formal training, but one of our partners that I failed to mention is Youth Opportunities Unlimited. And we work very closely with them and they are a partner with us. We have a designated internship specialist. And the per that person's role is to help be that coach and mentor, but also a, uh, a uh, advocate for the, for the student with the, uh, with the employers. So we have a very, uh, unique partnership where the employers have signed and dedicated an individual that on site manages the students that are within um, their companies. But we, we, once a year, we bring all of the employer partners along with Youth Opportunities Unlimited and our staff here at Magnet uh, together. And I do have my workforce team here uh, that I just wanted to recognize a little. But we work with them to make sure that as these students who are coming from a different cultural background are being accepted. So we do a lot of one-on-ones uh, with the students on a weekly basis to make sure that the environment that they're in is staying as a, a emotionally safe and, and, and racially or prejudicially uh, safe environment. And to their testimony, most of the students uh, that are participating in our program, well, none of the students I ever said they ever felt like an outcast, but a lot of the students, I was just in a meeting yesterday evening, and one of our students from Ginn Academy said that Lincoln Electric, he feels as though he's part of the family, that he's been adopted in as part of the manufacturing family, and that's actually been the experience of most of the students, of every student that we've talked to uh, that's gone through our program. Sorry. Thanks. Oh, you hold it, right. Uh, hello. <laughs> Hi, my name is Grace Kilbane. I'm director of Ohio Means Jobs, Cleveland, Cuyahoga County. And my question goes to, um, you know, here in the Cleveland area, there's a number of really good workforce uh, programs for training, placement, career counseling. And we have good data about what skills are needed, what jobs are in demand. But we also know that we don't have sufficient resources to meet that demand. Um, you know, you said it yourself, Bethany, 750 applicants for, you know, 150 spots. Uh, we run out of our training money like that. I mean, we, uh, we train about 500 people a year uh, in our organization. Uh, and uh, 
You know, last week, the president uh, issued an executive order that says, let's consolidate workforce programs and eliminate anything that looks like it's duplicative, which, of course, makes some sense on a policy level. But we know that there's never criticism of giving tax breaks for creating jobs. You can't, you can't throw enough public money at creating jobs, it seems. But developing the workforce is a challenge. Public funding's gone down over the last few decades, bound to go down some more. We know what the need is, but we can't meet it. What's the solutions? How do we take that on? And so I, I do want to say that um, we provide all of our training at no cost to the student. That means tuition, it means books, externship hours, bus passes, even food. Um, and so I agree with you. That's really difficult to do, and it's going to get more difficult. So I know that we could train 500 people. The key is making sure that we can get this community in this room right now to get excited to fund that. Because, and I don't know how we're going to do that. You know, I also think that one of the things that we have to really talk about and what I've seen over the last uh, few years is the number of employers who are saying, you know, if, if you can help me identify someone who would be predisposed to be good mm -hmm. in healthcare, in manufacturing IT, I have. Uh, a company founded here in Ohio who is a global company and one of their divisions and brands um, said to me the other day, we have such a hard time over our 17 U.S. and Canada locations finding people who want to be and work in our space and who will have the core competency and skill base. If you'll help us find them while they're in high school, we will help them, we will help pay for their training and development because if we don't, we're not going to be able to keep our doors open. So I think this is a different time for employers to step up. And I think in the past sometimes employers participated in internship programs and other programs where people went, um, you know, they got that day out of school or maybe they really thought they were interested, um, and then, but they didn't get a ROI on that. Um, someone came and then they went. But what if we could help make a better match up front? So I've been talking to a number of folks in this community who uh, hire interns who are saying, let's figure out what they'd be good at if they're gonna come to the Cleveland Clinic or if they're gonna come to the bank and work, and let's get them there as an intern and see if that works better. And if it does, then we're more willing to make an investment in their future because we can see that ROI. And so I think we have to, to look at the employer in a different way. We often ask the employer to fund uh, a broad swath. Let's all fund economic development. They have a business they need to run, and so they need to put their dollars where it's going to make an impact for their business, and we need them to do that so that there are more jobs. Yeah, and, and just really quickly to add on, I think uh, what Denise stated, the employers, having, holding them accountable more than just giving uh, charity or the dollars to, to just fund a program, um, but really, and when I talk with manufacturers, so I'm going to put this in manufacturing language, there's not one of their... Uh, suppliers in their supply chain, they don't look at their suppliers and just say, okay, just send me that product uh, and, and I'll make it work within my final uh, product. Um, but they have to look at their talent from a talent supply chain. And far too long, we've allowed them to sit on the sideline and just say, oh, I don't like the talent that's coming out of this in institution or this school district. But now I think we are, we are at a, a, a unique space and time where we can hold employers accountable to say, you need to be at the onset of your supply chain, which is at the high school level, in my opinion. But you need to actually have a vested interest in that supply chain and start saying, how are we going to help develop the talent for the future and, and, and make it more of a collaborative partnership where they have a vested interest. Uh, our program operates where the employers pay the dollar, uh, the salary for the students. So they're, they're not grant funded to pay the salary. That's their investment at this time, but in, in another couple of years, once proof of concept is there, we're going to ask for a much greater investment because this time that they invest in their uh, employee or talent supply chain. Hi, um, I work for a local community development corporation and we are beginning this conversation about how do we provide opportunities and connect our residents to some of these workforce training things that are happening. Um, and I entered into this about a year ago and realized it is not one job, one 
like employee. I was very naive thinking that it happened that way. Um, but as I started to try to untangle some of this and figure out, we are very fortunate. We have a ton of stuff in Northeast Ohio for job training and job readiness, but we can't get people transportation and childcare. And so how, how do we, you know, you mentioned Bethany providing transportation, but how, how are, what are some of the things you're doing to address some of those kinds of issues with the people you're working with? So I, I go back to this idea that, um, that once I gain confidence, gain a job, gain experience through a virtual employment opportunity that's really in a shared space that could be in my neighborhood. When we started Get Worker Fit, we partnered with the Cuyahoga County Libraries and hopefully the Cleveland uh, Municipal Libraries, but because every person in our county is one bus stop from a library. So we said if you need to get the educational program, we have to give access. So we have to think about scale and access. Employers who will do virtual employment think about that all the time. And so that helps with some of those issues so that we can work on it. The child care issue is a difficult one, but there are ways in which we can, we can solve that by creating these some sort of shared workspaces, but also might have shared child care. So that's one of those, those pieces. Once I gain confidence, once I realize that I am able and capable, figuring out how to take that public transportation from the east side to the west side is a lot less intimidating. One of the reasons that people don't leave their rural community to go to a job, say, in southern Ohio all the, uh, over to Cincinnati is because this is what I know, this is where I'm safe, this is where I know I belong. It's the same thing in our urban community. So once I begin to work and I gain confidence, I began to get exposures and venture out. I can remember when I was at Baldwin Wallace and I had a 70% first generation college student when I started there many, many years ago. And I took my first group of students to Nashville to an event. They, none of them had ever left the state of Ohio. They were terrified. I underestimated it. I moved here from Arkansas. That was really brave. And so I, you know, we, we forget that you have to have the first experience to gain the confidence. And so by building confidence first, then we can help solve these other issues because it's not that we don't have transportation, it's often that I don't know how or I may be intimidated to go from here to there. I think it's not one-time connection, right? It's not a one-time solution. So three years ago, we re-enrolled our first student who, uh, who was dismissed from the program due to attendance issues. And we came up with this marvelous idea that actually our repeat students have some of the best completion rates and the best placement rates because they weren't ready. But sometimes the only way to know that you're not ready is to start. And this is why the case management piece is so critically important. It's so, it's so um, important that our partners are there. So we focus on the technical skills training and admittedly we're not the experts in the case management, but I've got to trust that when Towards Employment says to me, you know, Mary's not ready, Mary's not ready. And that doesn't mean we disconnect, and it doesn't mean that she disappears. It means that we keep the communication lines open, and we hold slots for people um, because we know that that's a motivating factor. So you don't have your daycare ready? We're going to hold a slot for you in September. Can you work with us to set up goals and objectives so that you can get ready for the September 5th start? And here's your acceptance ladder because you're going to need that with your case managers, and you're going to. And so we're in that partnership sometimes well in advance, so that we can be successful. Yeah, from a transportation perspective, our program, uh, that was the number one issue for the employers when we brought it to them. After, how are you gonna have 16 year olds able to work in a manufacturing environment after where you're not gonna be able to find any students in Cleveland? After we overcame both of those objections, it was like, well, how are you gonna get them here? And, and, and we're thankful that we're funded, once again, by the Cleveland Foundation with transportation built in. But I think that's, if you actually read the uh, uh, FFEF report, uh, the distance, uh, and Brad Whitehead used this term yesterday, so I'm gonna steal it from him, distance discrimination. Because a lot of it, especially in advanced manufacturing, a lot of the uh, uh, work centers or clusters, the, the manufacturing clusters are in our outer ring suburbs. However, the largest need for uh, individuals to access those jobs are in the urban core. So that's not a, a solution that I have from a systemic perspective, but with our program, we built it in knowing that transportation was one of the top three major concerns from our manufacturing partners. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon. My name is Aaron Jeter from Solon High School. Uh, the question I have for you, this discussion is very important. I brought a group of students with me and we had a chance to read 
the two tomorrows a report they loved it right um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but seriously I think this reminds me of a quote we talked about in my African-American history class um, uh, by Booker T Washington no race can prosper till it learns that there is as much dignity in tilling a field as in writing a poem I guess the question you mentioned Dr. Robinson is about forming those partnerships with schools can you describe what's the benefit for the school how do you bridge those conversations so we could create an overall paradigm shift with students, parents, and the over entire school community to kind of see that as an avenue instead of just going to college. I see so many students come back either finishing two years and they're in $50,000 worth of debt. They're not sure where they're going to go. Uh, they get a four-year degree and maybe communications and there's really nothing out there for them. How do we change the paradigm shift within the entire school community and say, look, let's, let's try this, let's try this route. All right. Thank you. So, so Mr. Jeter, you're saying that even in Solon, you have students who are not completing uh, the four-year degree, um, which I think lends itself because, as we know, Solon is our number one ranked school district in the state. Um, it lends itself that this is a challenge for all school districts, not just Cleveland or, or your entering suburbs. Uh, but I would say we're at a unique moment, especially in the state of Ohio, and I can say. Uh, the state of Ohio is probably one of about five or six states that are progressive in this area as far as being at a moment where the policies are now changing and the policies are changing to advance the relationship uh, between and the partnership between educators and the education system and the employers. And when you make career readiness equally on par with college, uh, readiness and college attainment, you take away the stigma that has long since applied that if you go into a career, you go into manufacturing, you do something else other than go to college, you are seemed unsuccessful or you failed in some way. But when you can create a system that says we're going to uh, advocate for you and support you and celebrate you when you go and get a job at Lincoln Electric upon graduating high school equally as much as you getting accepted in the Case Western Reserve or Ohio State. That, that's what starts to foster that. But then a lot of it also comes into a parent engagement. Parents, I'm, I'm a product of that generation. You had to go to college, and college was the pathway for my success. I grew up in a different part of the country where military was also advocated, so it was college or military. Um, but it, it is now where we are coming back to a point where if we can tell students there are multiple pathways to success, and we can make it so that educators feel equally as powerful in telling a student, hey, you can go into this career field as much as going into college. I think that those uh, opportunities and bridges are being rebuilt um, because at one point in our country time, uh, the, the bridge was there. I just think that it's important to remember that these jobs that are in high demand, only 34% require, require a four-year degree. 70% of the high demand jobs require post-secondary education. And that doesn't mean you won't ever need or get a four-year degree. But I think you said earlier our life expectancy of your 18 today could be 110 or 115 years of age. We got some time there, right? That's on our side. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we don't have to do that right at 18. We could go find out and get some experience. But I think the other part of it is we have a, 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 classist, a classist attitude as parents. Um, those of us who are educated, uh, want our children to be educated. Um, we somehow believe that these jobs that we're talking about today, are we just trying to get the poor into those jobs? No, we're trying to get p lots of people from every socioeconomic walk of life. But sometimes it's, it's my friends at the cocktail party saying, where's your kid going to school next year? And we don't want to say, oh, they're going to a trade school or they're going to a technical program. And yet I cannot tell you the number of parents who approach me and say, okay, my kids graduated, they're living in the basement, they're miserable, they lost mm -hmm. their self-confidence, or worse yet, they didn't graduate. And they lost, and they really had wanted to go down to St. Clair and be in unmanned flight, but I insisted that they do four year, and now I feel like I, I did something wrong. Well, until we get honest at that level and understand that this 70% of jobs requires people from every background, then we're still gonna have a gap, and it's gonna be on the other side. It's not and I want to say to the students here, it's not either or. It's not technical skills training or college. Right. It's and both, and it's your chance to pick your timing. And I read an article that Harvard is um, showing a preference for kids who take gap years because they actually have a higher completion rate in college. So I highly recommend that you 
take your time to know what you're going to do so that you maximize that time. I'd love to go back and do my BA because I didn't maximize my time there. And if I had taken the time to work a little and have a better sense of what I wanted to do, I think I would have had a different college experience. I can't hold it. <laughs> Hi. I'm Pat Lepresti, uh, the first T at Cleveland. Bethany, and well, for all of you, thank you for your impact and dedication of changing lives, really, is what we're doing in Cleveland. Um, Bethany, you said when you... Uh, I wrote it down even. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> She's quoting you. You don't even know what you said, I think. But um, <laughs> I have no plausible <laughs> deniability at this point. This is terrible. <laughs> they need grit, perseverance, motivation to succeed. And, you know, on top of that, Denise, we're doing a great pilot with Get Worker Fit with some of our students. But to me, and we all have these great programs, and we're all coming from the outside, kind of pushing them in. How do we get from the inside and get these kids seeing the light and get motivated instead of, you know, kind of dragging them along and saying, oh, here's everything we could be doing for you? How do we get them saying, I want to succeed? How can I do it? So how do we light that fire? Yeah, so we, we're somewhat lucky because in our adult program, most of our participants have worked and they have gotten stuck, either stuck by wage or stuck by not being able to get to full time. So they have an internal fire that's pretty strong. Um, but one of the ways we're stoking that fire is that we do youth programming. And we do youth programming in part because we believe that the same skills that make you successful at school are the same skills that'll make you successful at work. And so when we're picking up a 30-year-old adult participant and we're saying, that person's missing the same skills that our ninth graders are, let's teach them here. We know that some of them will stick, some of them won't, and then it'll take that much less time to start again. But it's a continuum. I mean, we I struggle to find my own um, perpetual state of engagement, and I think everybody does. So, you know, and I think I think we've seen this uh, pad in the program that you have at the First T or at the Cuyahoga County Library or College now. We've been running a pilot that we've been funding for 500 people to go through, take the assessment, and really get the coaching. And what we've seen is unbelievable personal empowerment. I have been in this business over 30 years. I always had this color hair. <laughs> and uh, I didn't get it because of the stress of this, but maybe I should have. But what we have found is that when young people see this independent analysis of what they have to offer, or when young, we're, we're young adults, a 38-year-old male who's been, um, you know, string and wire for uh, audiovisual or uh, whatever gets hurt and knows he can't do that job, and he takes this assessment and he says, oh my gosh, I would have really been a great engineer, but I think it's too late. And we're saying, you're 38, so let's look and see what the stepping stones are. Okay, I can get a short-term certificate, and I can go in this kind of technology and IT, so while I'm on disability, I'm going to work on this, but then maybe I'll go to work for a company who will help me finish and actually be an engineer. I wish I'd known that I had that in me when I was 20, but at 20, I don't even know if I would have listened. But if we can give people the opportunity to see what's inside of them, all motivation, we know this, neuroscience, psychology, et cetera, it all comes from inside. And so we need to let people find out what's great inside of them and that somebody needs it. We have a desperate need for lots of stuff, but people just don't know that they've got what's needed. Hello, uh, I'm Prana Bayer. I'm a high schooler from Solon High School. And so my question sort of goes back to the idea of this talent gap. I know we said earlier that it starts, starts at the high school stage. We don't necessarily need a four-year degree to get a job. Um, but, and I, mean, I think we saw that when Amazon was searching for its second headquarters. They weren't just asking for what sort of post-secondary schools. They were asking looking for SAT scores, ACT scores. But in terms of Ohio, we rank 33rd out of all states for our standardized test scores. We rank in the bottom third of all states for funding. We know funding is going to go down. So how do we sort of address that issue, not just from the idea of like you know transportation gap, but also from an educational perspective? We have the second biggest socioeconomic divide between Shaker Heights and East Cleveland. How do we address those issues? <laughs> well. <laughs> We, we have political activism by the next generation that says, <laughs> I think what's happened in the nation by young people your age over the last few months, unfortunately triggered by, tra by tragedy, is what has to happen. There are a whole lot of people my age, we've been working on this problem a long time. One of my good mentors in this community, he's been working on this problem for 70 years. 
And he said to me the other day, you know, it's the, we still have these systems that we can't seem to do something about. We need a major push in this nation to say we can no longer inch along for change. There has to be a revolution around change, about the value of education, around the value of our young people, around the value of economic freedom and choice for every person who works. We as a great nation cannot innovate. We cannot be the leaders of the future. We cannot build what we come up with if people don't go to work and have choice. I think your generation is going to get the rest of us off of our seat and get us to quit being so politically correct and call it for what it is. What we have isn't working. We've got to have something new. I hope we have some of it, but we hope you have more of it. Okay. Uh, just to quickly dovetail off of Denise, um, I'm going to take my magnet hat off <laughs> and so that I can speak freely as Dr. Robinson. Um, our system is broken. And I think what it's going to take is redefining what's the purpose of education in our current economy. And if we can begin as policymakers and leaders, because while we do have a young generation that's coming along, you have individuals who are in uh, decision-making positions that can start to redefine what's the purpose of our education systems and that our workforce development, talent development, and our education systems have operated in silos even though they are interdependent upon one another. So it's, it's these opportunities where we can start to blend them and not business taking over education, but looking at it as two partners coming together to truly build out pathways for students that I think we have a really great opportunity in Northeast Ohio and the state of Ohio to start building up that region to where companies start to say, where's the talent? Because that's the battle. That's the battle for the next 40 years talent is your only competitive advantage. So where can I go that already has a system built that's going to create the talent for my company? Today at the City Club, we've been enjoying a forum with local leaders spearheading innovative workforce development programs, including Bethany Friedlander, President and CEO of Newbridge, Dr. Denise Reading, Chief Executive Officer at Get Worker Fit, and Dr. Terrence Robinson, Vice President of Workforce Development and Economic Inclusion at Magnet. Our moderator was Darielle Snipes of IdeaStream. Our forum today is part of the Workforce Development Series presented by PNC with additional support from Cleveland Foundation and the Deaconess Foundation. We thank you very much for your support of City Club programming. Lastly, we welcome students from Solon High School and Flow High School Co-op. Student participation is provided by many foundations, including the William M. Weiss Foundation. We thank all of you for being here today, and especially for that last quite awesome question. Mm -hmm. That brings us to the end of our program today. Thank you, Ms. Freelander, Ms. Snipes, Dr. Reading, Dr. Robinson. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Our forum is adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.